Let's assume your crew is assigned sortie number eight of your unit's emergency war order. You were launched under positive control some two hours ago, and the closing rate to your assigned target is seven miles every minute. You don't know whether this is the real thing or not. You won't know until you've reached your go, no-go position. The technical details of your air crew duties are second nature to you. You know your business. And through past experience, you know that every detail in your combat mission folder, the route, refueling areas, turn points, IPs, and delivery tactics, has been carefully planned and cross-checked by the most highly qualified staff of combat planners available. IBM computers have been freely utilized to feed adverse planning factors into your sortie, cranking in varied power settings, worst wind factors, loss of engines or power, as well as high and low delivery components. In all this, the planners aim to assure you the best fuel pad and time distance separation obtainable from weapon effects. You, yourself, have flown profile missions over and over again on USCMs and ORIs, and you know that the missions, whether high level or low, can be successfully accomplished as indicated in the tactical doctrine. But there is one area in which you've had little or no actual experience. Nuclear effects. So it is understandable if there is an air of uncertainty about it in the back of your mind. In reality, an abundance of experience on nuclear effects has been accumulated over the past 14 years. Hundreds of men have flown nuclear test missions in conjunction with detonations of high yield and low, both in the Pacific and Nevada test operations. This experience has been funneled to your combat mission planners so that your route beyond the H-hour control line commonly referred to as the HHCL, can be planned with maximum safety. The combat mission planners know there is no minimizing the awesome nature of this nuclear force, nor the extent of its effects. Here is a general refresher on each of these effects. Thermal, blast, and radiation, presented in their relationship to your aircraft. Thermal, the light and heat hazard, radiates from the detonation in two phases. The first phase is instantaneous, comprising only 1% of the total thermal effect. Yet, it is this phase of the pulse, occurring quicker than the normal blink reflex of the human eye, which is responsible for flash blindness. You must be about 80 nautical miles away to avoid even minor flash blindness when looking directly at the detonation. However, your thermal curtains keep out all but a minor portion of the light. The second phase of the thermal pulse is long and cumulative, with the heat energy building up on the aircraft like a hand held too long above a match. Whenever there is new snow on the ground or clouds above the flight level, some additional thermal effect is received. However, the aircraft skin coated with white paint, reflects most of the heat and the airflow over these surfaces further reduces the total heat absorbed. Also, the thermal curtains can withstand tremendous heat, almost twice the amount anticipated. After the thermal hot foot has passed, the shock wave arrives with its twofold effect of overpressure and gust. Overpressure, the sharp increase in pressure, consists of successive positive and negative phases which produce a wraparound crushing action. Overpressure is the dominating effect at low altitude. With the vulnerable structural parts of the aircraft being the bomb bay doors, radomes, and access panels. Gust is usually the dominating effect at high and medium altitude. Gust loading, similar to atmospheric turbulence, gives your aircraft a sharp jolt as it builds up on the lifting surfaces of the wing and horizontal stabilizer. 
nuclear radiation consists of instantaneous bombardment of gamma, neutron, alpha and beta rays, followed by radiation particles in the nuclear cloud, which later becomes fallout. Instantaneous radiation can be dismissed because of your distance from the burst. Fallout is a ground problem. As an air crewman, you need only be concerned with the nuclear cloud and the safe separation times given you by the EWO planners. This will be discussed later. In concluding this general rundown on nuclear effects, here is a representative chart showing the limiting envelopes of radiation and thermal compared to those of overpressure and gust. It took years of actual testing, millions of dollars, and a wealth of scientific and technological know-how to determine these envelopes on which your safe separation times and distances, as well as delivery tactics, are based. Shortly after the Hiroshima and Nagasaki results expanded concepts of warfare into atomic dimensions, men from the armed services the Atomic Energy Commission, and scores of scientific laboratories began trooping out to the Marshall Islands in the Central Pacific and to the desert wastes of Nevada for periodic nuclear weapon tests and weapon effects operations. Our interest concerns the effects testing, particularly the vast amount of time and effort devoted to gaining effects information on aircraft structures, from the crossroads operation all the way to the hardtack effort. On crossroads, a modest beginning was made when the Navy placed instrumented aircraft and separate components aboard its test ships in Bikini Lagoon. The kiloton yield Abel and Baker shots provided only a smattering of blast and nuclear radiation data. Nineteen fifty. Operation Greenhouse, Anyway Talk Atoll. Besides instrumented aircraft components set out on the islands in the vicinity of several kiloton size bursts, instrumented drones skirted the burst area to gather blast and thermal data. While preparations were made for the next test operation, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology utilized the crossroads and greenhouse findings to begin developing the concept on which the current SAC effects doctrine is based. 1952, Operation Ivy, Anyway Talk Atoll. The first thermonuclear detonation, known as the Mike shot, was achieved. Mike was a liquid fuel experiment, but its success proved out the fusion principle, paving the way for the equally successful dry material version, patterned for more practical weapon utilization. On Ivy, instrumented B-47 aircraft were sent aloft to be tested at 50% of thermal design. B-36s were tested for both thermal and gust loads, also at approximately 50% of design. 1953, Operation Upshot Knothole, Nevada, again featured kiloton yield bursts. In addition to B-36 and B-50 aerial testing, Ground tests were conducted on aircraft of several types, exposing them in various orientations to surface and air bursts at graduated overpressure levels, many beyond the breaking point. 5 laboratory tests and analyses concerning failure modes on aircraft through overpressure and gust effects. Nineteen fifty four. Operation Castle, Marshall Islands, involved aerial participation in megaton size events by B forty sevens and B thirty sixes. These aircraft, like those in all operations, were extensively instrumented by the Wright Air Development Center. For the B-47 test aircraft, 
Interest centered on the effects of radiant heat on the aluminum skin of the ailerons. Thermocouples mounted at selected points in the skin and supporting structure gave temperature readings, while radiometers and calorimeters in the fuselage gave thermal time history and total input. A variety of blast gauges and cameras mounted under the fuselage aimed at zero to assist orientation calculations completed the array. On five successive pre-dawn shots, the B-47 flight pattern at 35,000 feet was selected to position the aircraft where its aileron skin would receive the maximum allowable temperature rise to 370 degrees. In all instances, the maximum skin temperature rise was substantially lower than predicted. Heat damage in all cases was minor, involving only some patches of blistered paint at various points. The highest overpressure recorded on these five missions was around a third of a pound. 1955, Operation Teapot, Nevada. Teapot's most ambitious aircraft structures test involved three F-80 drones to investigate lethal blast effects at shock arrival time from a 22 kiloton tower shot. Each drone was completely instrumented for loading input and structural response data to check laboratory analytical predictions. Test results were obtained by telemetering the data to ground stations. The aircraft were positioned directly overhead at altitudes of 3,800, 4,300, and 5,100 feet. At the burst, high-speed cameras under the canopy recorded the crucial seconds of impact. The wingtip instrument pods of the lowest F-80, only 3,800 feet above the burst, were blown off with a shockwave. As this drone was being shepherded back to a landing, radio control was lost and it crashed. The other two drones suffered relatively minor damage. The middle drone was brought in without incident. While the top aircraft's nose wheel collapsed after landing, resulting in the drone's pileup at the end of the runway. The results of the F-80 test had important application to in-flight blast response for all types of aircraft. Also on teapot, this array of vertical stabilizers placed close to the burst provided information on structural response under gust loading. 